How long do you play tennis already? Uh, about five years. And what would you like to achieve in tennis? Achieve? Um, just to be the best player I can work to be, so. And who is your, who is example for you would like to be, like Andre Agassi uh, or Pete Sampras? Probably Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi. Both yeah, of them. Yeah. Eight. Thinking that far ahead yet. Nine. Ten. Work. Oh. Nice effort. Hi, guys. What do you think? How did tennis change in past 20 years? Uh, it's changed a lot. I think athletic ability has a lot to do with the game. Uh, I know there's better equipment and there's, everybody says more power, but I think there's more athletes in the game of tennis. Size is also a factor, but the, the one thing that I've realized is the most important thing is it hasn't changed. It's the size, what, what's in here. That hasn't changed, but the, the game's quicker and faster and just better athletes. Roddick is on fire in this set. Well, he knows if he can get to the ball, he's got the entire area to play with. But he goes around the net. That's more like it. Rick, you are considered to be the number one tennis coach, or the number one junior development tennis coach in the world. Um, the stats just prove it all, and the, the amount of champions that have come through your academy just, just proves that fact. Tell me about your work with Andy Roddick. Yeah, An Andy Roddick, is, it's very interesting, because I had his brother John uh, for three years. Uh, great player, he got the finals Australian Open Juniors, All-American at Georgia, a great player. Um, and then his little brother, Andy, you know, uh, the mom and dad wanted me to start working with him. He came to me at nine years old, and it was very interesting. Right off the bat, he was the most feistiest, uh, competitive. It was almost like you know, a mosquito that would just keep bothering you, and you just, get, you just couldn't get him away. I mean, the guy was just right there, and he always had to be the first one to get a drink, first one in line, uh, but, but I just loved that. His thirst for competition was like no other. So from a, and John was like that, his older brother, but this guy was like, he was like a little pipsqueak, but his, it was just crazy how competitive he was, but that's the wild card. Because if you're that competitive, you'll handle pressure better. I'm not saying you'll never choke or get nervous, but when you're all about the competition, like that deep, everybody's competitive. But I saw it at nine years old. Okay, I just saw it. And every time he lost, he'd come up, can I play him again? Can I play him again? I say, well, you gotta earn it, okay? 10 minutes later, can I play him again? Was, but I love that, you know? So that's what I saw in Andy. But it was very interesting because technically, he almost taught me a little bit on the forehand because this was the early 90s, okay? This was 1991 when I had Andy. And he led with the elbow back and now that's a common staple on, pro, on the Pro Tour. I'm not saying he was the first of the Mohicans that brought this in, okay? But when I watched him take the racket back, I noticed one thing. When he led with the elbow and then he swung the racket, the racket kind of flipped down and back um, and made the racket go faster. To a lot of people, it looked wristy or it looked like he was using his wrist. But when it hit the slot, it came back and it was all connected. And I'm sitting there watching this guy, because back then I played, me and him would battle, and uh, nothing personal, Andy, but I won pretty easily, but I'm sure you'd win now. But so, his forehand was amazing, but it was very different. It wasn't like people before him. And it was the ATP forehand before anybody knew what the ATP forehand was. He had it to the outside, the racket, he would pull it, it would flip, and I'm watching this, but back then I didn't understand the science part. I just saw it works, it's special, and this is a weapon this little kid had. He could just nail the forehand, okay? Did a lot of work on the forehand to try to clean it up and hit it flatter. Tweaked his grip a little bit, because he was kind of under. We tweaked the grip a little bit. The backhand was always pretty flat, okay? I wanted him to hit with more topspin, but it stayed pretty flat. Tried to work a lot on his chip, just because his athleticism was above average, 
okay? He's not going to be the number one athlete on the tour, but it was good enough to get the job done, okay? Uh, tried to spend a lot of time at the net uh, because he had hard hands. His hands weren't soft, okay? Some people have soft hands. Like Venus had, I mean, Serena and Venus had very soft hands in general. Capriati had hard hands. Roddick had hard hands. So if your hands are soft, like you're just Velcro, you can massage it. So we try to spend a lot of time on the volley, okay? And we try to get the most out of it. Even though he was never really gonna become like a Federer or someone like that at the net, just spend a lot of time um, on, the, on the volley just to get better feel. But the big ticket item was the serve. You know, it was very interesting because when he took the racket back, his shoulder actually went back maybe further than anybody I've ever coached. It was a genetic thing. Farther than his brother, it just went back farther naturally. It wasn't forced. And I thought that was very interesting. But it also made him, when he came to me, he did what we call pinpoint. He'd bring the foot up, no problem. You can do platform or pinpoint. And he would lean so much, the hand would what we call externally rotate. People might call this like a pancake, frying pan, pizza, waiter. The hand would go the wrong way. And so his serve was pretty bad, okay? Um, now, going forward, okay, I think people will agree. When he was on the tour, he had the fastest serve on the tour with the highest percentage. And this is all biomechanics. And when they had a rain delay the year that he won the US Open uh, as a 19 year old or 18, they put his serve as a 12 year old. And the way he was serving at the US Open. And the best sports science people in the globe, around the globe said, that's amazing. It was identical. The cartwheel, the land, the entry of the racket, everything, the pronation, everything was the same, except instead of, you know, 5'2", 100 pounds, it was 6'2", 180. But it was the same movement, and they kept showing that in the player's lounge. It was epic, okay? But the work done on his serve, because that was heading in a very wrong direction. Unless someone understands biomechanics and how the legs drive the racket, um, and then he liked it to put his feet together, okay, to get more vertical component. He developed his own take back where he would go here and then there. That's all window dressing. So it's not a wrong way or right way. It's a better way how you take the racket back, but it's all how the legs connect to contacting the ball. So once again, you know, it's not in the water. You know, Roddick ends up with one of the greatest serves ever in the history of tennis. And so do Venus and Serena, especially Serena. So there are certain boxes that are checked. I know you need a thoroughbred to win the derby. You know, you can't put it on a donkey, I get that. But the dirty work that had to be done, you know, with these young kids, especially Andy Roddick, uh, was amazing. And more importantly, the opportunity to always play people better, to compete against better people, to be pushed, okay, and be motivated, and look at the world through a different set of eyes, even though he looked at it very differently already because he was a, just a nasty competitor. But I love that, feisty, nasty competitor. Um, so yeah, I worked with Andy for like three, four years. Um, one of the best times of my life. One of, it was a funny story. I went to see uh, the Nebraska-Miami football game, oh, Florida State, Nebraska, because they're from Nebraska. And I'm sitting in the middle. John's on my right and Andy's on my left. And I'm watching the game and I'm for Florida State and the whole crowd's for Nebraska. And every time Florida State would do something good, I get an elbow from one Roddick on this side and an elbow on that side. So I couldn't even root for the team. That's how competitive Andy Roddick was. But I love the guy.